Yeah, I, I agree entirely with that. And in, in support, I would say, I mean, that's the whole difference between science and religion, right? The scientific method is basically following the evidence no matter where it takes you. And then you have to reassess, reevaluate and adapt your hypothesis and if need be even discard it entirely and look for a new alternative explanation. Um, and by doing so, you or one demonstrates uh, embracing the scientific method rather than uh, superstitious beliefs. Um, and and that's, that's the whole issue here about religion and rationality, but let me throw this back at you in the following way. Some people say that the singularity is religion for geeks. Uh, rupture of the geeks is another way of putting it. Uh, Jaron Lanier once called it the Church of Robotics, for example. So what do you say to that kind of uh, criticism? I mean, taking it to the personal level with you, one can say, well, look at look, he used to be a Christian evangelical, you know, embracing God and the rupture and all of that, and now he just replaced God with the singularity and our, the almighty artificial intelligence, which would have the power to eventually uh, destroy us. So, it's really, nothing has changed. He just replaced one God with another. Uh, yes. Uh, the difference, of course, is that, um, you know, my current worldview is more informed by probability theory and science than by faith. But um, the the trouble, the, the criticism about the singularity being uh, religion or of the nerds or rapture of the nerds um, is often not that far off because the singularity term means a lot of things. And a lot of people uh, that I meet think of the singularity as basically just excitement about the future and how technology and AI will just fulfill all our wildest dreams and create a utopia and we just need to like accelerate AI progress as much as possible so that we can fulfill all of our wildest dreams. Uh, and I think that that does have a lot of qualities of religious faith and not really looking seriously at the evidence about uh, how these things will evolve. Um, I think that uh, in particular, a, a lot of people that we have a pro, we have a branding problem with the singularity term right now. Um, in up until about 2005, the term singularity meant um, in technology anyway, not mathematics and physics, but in technology, this term singularity meant uh, sort of the creation of machine superintelligence or maybe the process of radical self improvement by which we reach machine intelligence or the fact that once we have an intelligence more intelligent than ourselves, we can't predict what the future will be like because we're not uh, steering the future anymore, something like that. Uh, and then in 2005, Ray Kurzweil published his book, The Singularity is Near, which had a different picture of the singularity. And so the meaning of the word singularity in the popular culture changed. Uh, and so that's a bit of a confusion a lot of times for people. Uh, Ray Kurzweil did an amazing job of bringing a lot of important and true transhumanist ideas to the world at large where everybody else before him had failed. Um, so props to him for that. But it's a bit confusing uh, because there's like the machine superintelligence idea of singularity, which Ray does devote a chapter of his book to. Uh, but then Ray sort of more has uh, promulgated this idea of the singularity as uh, accelerating change for lots, maybe all technologies, and uh, sort of the technology feeding off on itself, humans having to cyborg themselves into connections with the machines in order to keep up with uh, technological progress um, and sort of very optimistic about the future of all that. Um, and so uh, I think that there's a lot of analyses for technological forecasting that can be more detailed than um, you can put into one chapter of your book like Ray did. Uh, so there's a paper by Belenaghi and some colleagues at uh, the Santa Fe Institute that analyzed the data from many, many different technologies over the long term and what sort of technological progress they had. And uh, they did show generally exponential curves. And so that's sort of in support of Kurzweil's claim. But you have to be more careful than that. There are some really important qualifications with that research. Uh, one is that they tested laws of technological change with linear regression models, which is not theoretically appropriate because um, the assumptions of independence and so on don't actually aren't satisfied by the data. 
Um, a bigger one is that um, most of the technologies were examined for relatively sh small time slices, uh, so we can't pick up long-term trends. Another one is that when you're looking at exponential growth patterns, for the first part of the curve, they look the same if they're exponential curves or logistic curves, which is like an S-shaped curve. So depending on which one that turns out to be, the future tech predictions should be very different. Um, and then uh, another is that the performance curves database that Nagi, Nagi is using uh, isn't very representative to, of technologies in general yet. So you have to be really careful when you look at this type of research and not just assume, well, look at all these pretty graphs. Uh, everything's going to change exponentially and uh, it's all going to be good because AI and all these technologies are going to solve all, all our problems and cure death. Uh, you have to look at things a lot more carefully than that. Um, and it's really complicated and really difficult and really easy to be wrong. <laughs> okay, so, so let me ask you about this then. What is the personal requirement in terms of knowledge and skills to be able to, to make such a judgment? Um, and another way to to formulate the same question would be uh, the usual criticism that's leveled against the singular or one of the the ones that I've seen more often that's leveled against the Singularity Institute is something like this. A bunch of young guys uh, gathered together, most of them not really educated, without any advanced degrees, some of them didn't even graduate from university, trying to save humanity. <laughs> how does that sound to you and, and how accurate or inaccurate is such a description? Um, do you want me to just respond to the, the criticism part um, instead of the first part? Whatever you prefer is, or you okay. think is more appropriate. I'll just respond to that criticism. Um, it's true that uh, in general uh, our people that we have right now uh, dropped out partway through because they thought they had better things to do with their time. And uh, in fact, we, one of the things that we do is career counseling and uh, for, for certain people who are high impact. And uh, we very often look at uh, the analysis of the situation and, and recommend that they drop out of school and, and do something more productive with their life. Uh, often it's the case that going through academia is the best way to go. Um, but a lot of times it's not. Um, a lot of times it's a lot of hassle and a system that is not really optimized for uh, producing valuable work, but a system that is optimized for, you know, maybe kind of teaching and building up some kind of prestige and producing lots of words in journals. Um, so, you know, I, we have a, a counterpart in Oxford University named the Future of Humanity Institute that is credentialed and is staffed with people who have PhDs and are working a lot of these same problems and I love the work that they put out. It's really valuable but they're the exception uh, and so yeah we, we sort of thought that um, working on these problems directly was going to be was more urgent uh, than getting PhDs um, but yeah whether you have a PhD or not what matters is one your command of the material so if you can show that you have the command of the material then um, the degree is just supposed to be an indicator of that. So you're sort of going directly to the thing that actually matters when, you're, when you look at the command of the material. And then the maybe uh, just as important or more important thing for us is uh, evidence of someone's ability to change their mind in response to evidence and catch themselves in the act of uh, falling prey to their common human biases and changing their, changing their mind or using algebra and probability theory instead of their intuitive heuristics. Um, you know, these signs of rational thought and seriously caring about the truth uh, and having true beliefs instead of seriously caring about feeling like we tried to get the truth or signaling that we care about the truth. Uh, that, those qualities of rationality are really important as well. So. Um, it's not that we uh, try to avoid people who happen to have PhDs. It's just that we care more about other evidences like actual command of the material and actual command of uh, rational practice and thought. So let me grab that part because it, it is going to also address the first part of the question, which is what is, what is the actual material that you guys are looking for, which is relevant uh, for the work that you do? Uh, at Singularity Institute. 
Is it uh, computer science? Is it advanced mathematics? Is it physics? Is it philosophy? Uh, what is it? It's, uh, so I have this document on my website, lukeprog.com, that's called So You Want to Save the World. And that's sort of a cheeky title, but what it really is is a, an outline of the categories of problems that need to be solved in order, we think, in order for AI to go well instead of poorly for humanity. And so some of the problems are in decision theory, some of the problems are in the cognitive science of value, uh, some of the problems are in AI architectures or mathematics in general, uh, first order logic, uh, definitely a lot in computer science like Solomonoff induction, how to handle logical uncertainty, things like that. Um, so there's a huge array of problems and that document kind of points you to some of the existing literature on that particular category of problem and then explains uh, what the part that we don't have solved yet is. Uh, and so if researchers are interested in uh, doing research to save the world instead of to get tenure or solve lesser problems, then I invite them to uh, go to lukeprog.com and skim through the document called So You Want to Save the World and see if there are problems in that document that you are expert in and might want to contribute towards solving. Um, I know that's pretty blunt, but uh, it is what I believe. I think this is the most important uh, research problems in the world for the future of humanity and we need really intelligent mathematicians and computer scientists and philosophers and uh, physicists because physicists can do anything uh, to look at those problems and help us solve them.